I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Jack's formal biography. Uh, you all know it. It's in the book, and I assume and hope that each one of you will buy one. It's a great book. Uh, but talk a little bit about uh, some of the anecdotes uh, of when I first met Jack in Moscow in 1961. Uh, and the stage that we were in at that time. Jack, uh, as was the tradition, I think it probably still is, as the new boy coming into the embassy, uh, was put into the concert section uh, and didn't really have a lot to do because tourism was somewhat limited and, and uh, there were no crises. Or occasionally there'd be some uh, religious group that was being persecuted who would get into the basement of the embassy somehow, but basically it was a, not a too challenging a task we quickly found out about Jack's background, having taught Russian history at Dartmouth and literature, and realized that we had a un very unusual asset. This was in the Khrushchev era, and he had unleashed with his secret speech uh, the uh, bubbling up of opposition and criticism, and it was all appearing in literary circles. And you had to know Russian literature to understand what these people were writing and the messages they were sending to other Russians. And frankly, uh, those of us in the political section at that time were not that well versed in Russian culture. We were real big on what was happening in Laos and Berlin, but not too big on, on uh, uh, the great Russian writers and, and the plays that were being staged and so forth. So we reached out, and I take credit for this, and we got Jack and recruited him in to the political section to moonlight. He did his day job at the consular section, but, uh, and he wrote a series of dispatches, which we used to send in those days, um, about uh, the ferment in the Russian intellectual world that was going on as a result of Khrushchev's openings. Uh, and they were extremely well received, and he received a presidential citation for those. So we knew we had a winner from the beginning. And we also had a lot of other interesting <coughs> experiences together with Codell's. Uh, I remember Jack was assigned to handle Jack Javits and his wife. Jack Javits was a wonderful senator and a wonderful man. Marion, his <laughs> wife, was another, was another issue. She decided she was going to teach uh, Moscow uh, the twist. And so we had to take her around to various restaurants in Moscow, and she'd get up on the dance floor, and it was really quite a spectacle. And here's a wife of a very prominent U.S. senator, but she kept saying, you know, everybody thinks I'm Jackie Kennedy. Well, I had met Jackie Kennedy. She was no Jackie Kennedy. <laughs> but between us, uh, uh, she beat up on Jack because he was just not too appreciative. And I grew up in New York, where Javits was from. I was a little more used to the, to the personality. And between us, we got them in and out of town. And uh, that was one of our bonding experiences, Jack, and I've, I've never forgotten that. But I'm uh, really so proud of what you've done, and I'm so proud of what the Foreign Service has done, and our record in Moscow, and the kind of people that we've had there over the 50 years of the Cold War, our staff in the embassy in Moscow was consistently outstanding and outshone all other embassies by far. And in my judgment, we ran rings around the Russians uh, in terms of quality representation. Uh, Jack moved on to uh, top jobs and ended up in the NSC at one point, uh, where he was Reagan's principal uh, Russian advisor at a time when Cap Weinberger and George Shultz were battling over the carcass uh, and it was really very, very bitter, and I would say in many ways more challenging to try and deal with Weinberger and Richard Pearl and his other uh, declare economic warfare on, on Moscow uh, than even dealing with the Russians. At least the Russians were predictable. Jack was in the middle, and he was the key man in shaping Reagan's reaction to this dispute. And I give you great credit, Jack, for the fact that Schultz won that battle and was in charge of our relations with Moscow and Weinberger was appropriately sidelined. And I think that was a very important contribution to the successful conclusion of the Cold War. So when you went on to be ambassador in Moscow at a time, and we were just talking about it before this meeting, um, he established a personal relationship with Gorbachev which was, and Shevardnadze, which were really phenomenal. 
and would, Gorbachev would invite him in and ask for his views about the situation in Russia. And uh, one other anecdote I'll tell you, had a dinner party for Condoleezza, who, who was on the NSC staff at that time. And she came out and Jack collected eight Soviet marshals, the top military brass in the Soviet Union, for a dinner party. And Condoleezza walked in and, of course, the first thing, uh, they sort of all looked up and thought she must be the maid, typical of the racist uh, Soviets. And within, as Jack told the story, within a half an hour, she had them eating out of her hand. She knew more about their missile systems than they did. And that, that gave me great comfort when she became the NSC advisor, knowing that she had that kind of in-depth background. Uh, I think going on to the Kennan seat at Princeton, uh, Jack has become, in my eyes, and I think in the eyes of everybody who deals with this part of the world, he is the new George Kennan. And I think his writings today and the book that he's going to talk about today lay out, as Kennan did, uh, historic visions and, and perspectives on our relationship with Russia, which are still absolutely critical. So I think we're, uh, we're blessed, and I'm honored, and Jack, here's to you. I came today to talk about uh, the book that has been published recently, uh, Superpower Illusions. And let me start by saying that that was not my original title. Uh, when I was working on it, my working title was Distorting History. And then when I sent the manuscript in to the publisher, the editor said, hey, you know, no, people don't want to read about history. Well, that was news to me. I thought there were plenty of history books uh, on it. But he said, no, people don't want to re read about history. Uh, let's make it something more contemporary. And I said, well, you know, I do bring it up to the present and make some general suggestions. Uh, but they wanted something more contemporary. And we finally, after a fairly long negotiation, uh, settled on superpower illusions. And it'll be clear in a few minutes why that also fits uh, basically, I started writing the book because I got increasingly disturbed, uh, beginning in the late 90s, and then particularly uh, after the turn of the century, <clears throat> with the way the end of the Cold War and the implications for the end of the Cold War was misunderstood very widely uh, in the United States, in Europe, and particularly in Russia a number of quite unfounded myths tended to get fixed in the public eye. And then these were actually exploited, I think, by those who, in my opinion, were pushing American policy in the wrong direction. And this is where the original distorting history came in. And you can say, well, what are some of these misunderstandings? Well, let's start with um, the fall of the Soviet Union. I don't know how many of you saw the multi-part uh, television show on the Cold War. Well, it ends with the Russian, f the red flag coming down from the Kremlin and the Russian flag going up. And I was shown that particular segment before it went on the air, and I told the producer that wasn't the end of the Cold War. The Cold War had, was already over two or three years before that happened. Uh, and, uh, and he said, yeah, but uh, that's not dramatic. And I said, well, <laughs> are you doing drama or are you doing history? Uh, well, obviously, it was much more dramatic to make it the fall of the Soviet Union. But the fact of the matter is that the Soviet Union collapsed for reasons which are connected indirectly with the fall of the Soviet Union with the end of the Cold War, but was not a direct result. On the contrary, I believe that three important things happened in world politics toward the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 1990s. The first was the Cold War did end, and one can argue precisely when this was, but ideologically, it ended with Gorbachev's speech to the United Nations, December 7th, 1988. Why did it, uh, do I say that it ended then? Because it was in that speech that he officially buried the fundamental Marxist concept of 
the class conflict, the international conflict, being the basis of Soviet policy. And in my opinion, all the other issues of the Cold War flowed from that ideology. Uh, obviously, it took on geopolitical, it took on economic, it took on many other dimensions. But what made it different from normal great power maneuvering was this ideology. And suddenly, it was not there. And those of us who were then in Moscow or dealing in Soviet affairs, you found that though it, it was not just an overnight change, the change had begun earlier and it continued, but basically from late 88 and right on into 89, we and the Soviet negotiators were working off the same game book. By that I mean we were trying to achieve the same end and to clear up the, the detrius of the Cold War. So the Cold War had already ended uh, before the Soviet Union uh, uh, started seriously to fall apart. What happened next? Well, next, the Communist Party lost control of the Soviet Union. And I recall when the Economist magazine put on its cover when Ronald Reagan died, the man who beat communism. No. I think Reagan led us in negotiations that ended the Cold War in the interests of both countries uh, when he got cooperation from Gorbachev. But Gorbachev brought an end to communist control in the Soviet Union by his reforms internally, which he could not have done if we had not ended the Cold War. So the end of the Cold War permitted Gorbachev to do what his country desperately needed, which was to free them up from the top-down totalitarian controls of the Communist Party. Then, having freed them up from those controls, all the contradictions of that system, contradictions that George Kennan had actually noted back in the 1930s when he first went to our embassy in Moscow as one of our first Russian language officers. And he said, this is a system with internal contradictions which cannot, you know, last forever, and that as long as we keep them from expanding, from seeming to justify the system by expanding abroad, if we can contain them, they'll bring themselves down. Uh, well, a lot of, this wasn't, it took a lot longer than I think George thought at the time, uh, but in fact, this was, you know, profoundly correct. And uh, it was Gorbachev's internal reforms that loosened up things as he began to respond to our demands to open up with more information from outside and so on, which he did not because we demanded it, but because he was convinced that that's what they needed to do. Uh, and it would be a, a long story, perhaps, uh, as to how we constructed our diplomacy to try to bring them to that point. But basically, we did it by defining our goals as the need to cooperate to achieve certain ends. And in most cases, this required them to do a lot more than we did, but we didn't put it that way to begin with. We must cooperate to reduce arms, particularly the most dangerous ones. We must cooperate to reduce violence in third areas. We must cooperate to improve respect for human rights. Instead of beating on them that, uh, you know, you're beating on your people, you've got to stop it, et cetera, et cetera. We must cooperate to build a better working relationship. That was a euphemism we devised for bring down the Iron Curtain. The way to persuade them to do it is not say, you got to bring down the Iron Curtain, but to say, look, you know, we both need better contacts between our peoples. And we began to put that in the president's speeches, that the lack of contact was dis uh, depriving people on both sides of the values that each society had to offer. Uh, so part of the things we did without really changing any basic American policies was to cast them in a different light. Uh, 
but, and then finally, of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was entirely because of internal pressures and not U.S. pressure. You may recall uh, that uh, President Bush, or the first President Bush, made a speech in Kiev October, um, August 1st, 1991, where he actually endorsed uh, Gorbachev's attempt to form a voluntary federation. He recommended to the non-Russian republics that they, uh, uh, that they adhere to Gorbachev's Union Treaty, probably going beyond what an American president should do in terms of advising others on their internal politics, but he stood firmly for what Gorbachev was trying to do. And he also added some very interesting things. One was freedom and independence are not synonymous. Choose freedom. And the second was you must avoid suicidal nationalism. What was he referring to? He was referring to Georgia, because the Georgians had already attacked South Ossetia, Skin Valley, uh, in the middle of the winter, and uh, were uh, creating the problems there. And uh, of course, this speech at home, uh, Bill Sapphire called it his chicken Kiev speech, because in effect, he was endorsing what was going on in the Soviet Union. And you could say, why in the world do we do that? Two big reasons. One was we didn't want to see 12 new nuclear powers in the world. And even though they were beginning to consolidate uh, where their nuclear weapons were, that we, when it broke up, we still had four uh, that had to be dealt with. But the second was that it was very clear to us in Moscow that Gorbachev was a liberating force and that if the Soviet Union broke up prematurely, many of the areas, and particularly those in Central Asia, would uh, revert to uh, an authoritarian type of rule uh, because the democratic forces there were being supported and preserved out of Moscow uh, and not locally. And of course, we have seen, in fact, when the Soviet Union broke up, much greater difficulties in many of the republics outside the Baltic states. In any event, the point is that we, it was not our policy to bring down the Soviet Union, and that's another of the myths. So what happened after the Cold War ended? Uh, did it become a unipolar world? Was there just one superpower? This, again, is one of the most, I think, disturbing and dangerous of the stereotypes that came out. First of all, the whole idea of superpower was exaggerated. What do we mean by it? Well, both the United States and the Soviet Union had enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world. Several times over, as a matter of fact. Big deal. Did we have the power to form, to cause other governments to settle their problems or particularly to put a different uh, internal structure in their government? Well, the Soviet Union tried in Eastern Europe and in certain other parts of the world, and they ended up with uh, states that uh, were actually hostile to them, as we saw it later, rather than uh, states that were an asset. Uh, the, neither of us had the power, actually, to affect other countries in very basic ways. And if, if superpower is the power to destroy, then, of course, Russia and the United States still have the power to destroy the world with over a thousand nuclear weapons uh, on. Actually, it seemed to me that American power decreased at the end of the Cold War because the Allies, and particularly after the Soviet Union collapsed, because our Allies no longer needed us to protect them. And therefore, what we should have done was really take a real peace dividend in the 90s. And since we did not need any more to contain communism, to begin to withdraw from direct involvement in other people's fights. We had been drawn into them, and I think for adequate reason during the Cold War, afterward we didn't. Instead, we sort of just stumbled into one, I think, era after another. I recount them in the book. Uh, and 
the whole idea that there is one superpower, we are it. Now we have enough power that if we simply use our military power, we can do anything we choose, whether or not we have allies. And that is the psychology that got us into Iraq uh, and uh, has kept us involved, I think, militarily in disputes uh, that uh, now we just we need to wind up, and I think this is increasingly being recognized. Now, when I finished the book, it was really in the very first months of the Obama administration, and I had very great hope uh, for a basic shift in the direction of our policy, and I think we've seen that shift, basically. Uh, there are certain areas of our policy that I would like to see uh, still change further, but uh, now, I think finally, we are uh, beginning uh, to head uh, more generally in the right direction, but there's still major problems out there. And as I will point out, and I'm sure it's no news to you, uh, the great difficulty in changing policy uh, when we have the sort of political system we do, uh, which allows interest groups to have uh, such great power in, on certain questions. Uh, is, uh, I find, rather disturbing. And uh, I, with several other former ambassadors, I had a meeting with some of the Senate staffers yesterday afternoon talking about the possibility for uh, ratification of the New START agreement. That should be a no-brainer. For and, and, and it's not a partisan issue. It would have been a no-brainer for the Reagan administration. Uh, but apparently, for reasons most of which have nothing to do with the treaty itself, it looks as if it, uh, we can't be sure that it's going to be ratified. So I would say that situation still worries me. Uh, but I, uh, I do uh, want to uh, say that I believe that as we move ahead, and not, whether it's the Obama administration or whether in two years we get another one, I think it is very clear that the Foreign Service is going to be facing a very great challenge because willy-nilly the United States is going to be withdrawing militarily from many places in the world. We simply cannot afford it. So the, the, the diplomatic effort to do this in a way that is relatively smooth that keeps certain stability is going to require great skill. And it's the sort of thing which almost is, you might say, is the reverse image of what we needed to do during the Cold War, which was to contain the Soviet Union to build alliances. Now I think we have to find a way to build international structures to which we can contribute, but shift more and more of the responsibility to other countries. That is the task of diplomacy, and that is going to be, I think, a real challenge for you. How do I see developments in Russia after the end of the Cold War? I'll put it very briefly. I, there's quite a bit in, in, in my book about that. Uh, I think they went through a very, very difficult and traumatic period in the 90s, uh, a period where uh, life for most people was m more similar to anarchy and chaos uh, than it was to anything we would resemble as uh, would uh, regard as democracy. And for many Russians, this has given democracy a bad name because they were told, okay, you got democracy now. Uh, you got elections, after all. Uh, and I think it does show that uh, elections, as, as essential as they are to a democratic process, are not necessarily uh, the, the best way to start a democratic society because uh, one needs institutions, one needs attitudes, one needs a lot of things to make something as messy as democracy really work. And uh, they didn't have it. I, I uh, recall in 1991, we had a visit of an American warship, first time since World War II, to Sevastopol, uh, the Black Sea port. And uh, during that visit, uh, one of the admirals in their Black Sea fleet uh, took me on a tour of the Crimea and we went to Yalta. And the mayor was taking us around, and there was a nice beach there, but one area had a barrier up, and it said, no swimming danger uh, in Russian. And there were maybe 20 people swimming out there. 
And I asked the mayor, I said, well, you, don't you enforce your safety rules? He said, oh, we have democracy now. We can't tell people what to do. Uh, well, you know, somehow it's something that got missed in the translation uh, of the word. Uh, uh, so um, they went through a difficult period. And I think that the reason uh, with many Russians, uh, Prime Minister Putin is as popular as it is, it seems that he, with the help of rising oil and energy prices, uh, that he was able to pull them out of what was uh, really a very chaotic situation. In the 90s, when I talked to Russians, many of them would say the, the most difficult thing is, although I'm not living that badly in, in many cases, everything is unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. I can't really depend on anything. Well, P Putin gave them a certain predictability. Uh, to those who argue that Russia went back on democracy, I would say they never had it. So let's forget that. Let's, but if you think that Russia has gone back to anything like the situation they had in the Soviet Union until the very end and with Gorbachev's reforms, they're forgetting a lot of things. One of the most onerous things in the, uh, in the Soviet Union was the inability of people to travel, even in their own country, and particularly outside. Now, there's, there's total freedom of travel. You don't, there's freedom of speech. I mean, you may not get on national TV if you're critics of the government. You probably won't. But you're not arrested for it. Uh, and uh, and um, the publications, okay, the government controls uh, the media, uh, the mass media, meaning national television, uh, but you can publish anything you want in a book or in uh, uh, journals, and uh, there are even some relatively free newspapers. So uh, many of the, uh, the restrictions on f freedom uh, that you had in the Soviet period have not been reimposed. And uh, so, I mean, the average Russian is living much better now than they did in Soviet times. And I think that uh, when Putin says that anybody who doesn't regret uh, the demise of the Soviet Union has no heart, he also adds, anybody who would like to put it together has no brain. Uh, <laughs> Because Russians do associate the collapse of the Soviet Union with a period of nearly a decade of economic dislocation, of, of humiliation, uh, and these Cold War stereotypes I was talking about being treated as a defeated nation. And this almost was the most uh, uh, worrisome part of it. Uh, and right now, I think that the reset is going fairly well. Uh, we, uh, we have meetings every few years of our former ambassadors. We just had one ended yesterday here. And two years ago, we made a list of things we need, thought most countries needed to do. Uh, we're happy to say now that actually they seem to be doing them. Uh, and uh, if, if we can get uh, uh, the New START agreement ratified and then continue on uh, the arms control course with them and work out a cooperative way to deal with missile defense, I think we will find that Russia can be very helpful in many areas. Basically, as far as our relations are concerned, and my judgment is that for the United States, Russia is going to be either a part of the solution or a part of the problem to every big issue we have can make your choice which you want to make it be. For Russia, the United States is either going to be part of the solution or the part of the problem for every big problem they have. So uh, it seems to me we need to bear that in mind. Stop trying to teach each other, or it's mainly a matter of Americans trying to teach Russians the way they should govern themselves. Uh, we wouldn't put up with that if they criticize some of our more bizarre uh, uh, electoral and uh, uh, governmental uh, habits, uh, like electing presidents who have fewer votes than uh, the, uh, uh, the opponent. Uh, and uh, I don't think uh, most of them uh, appreciate uh, too much 
uh, Monday morning quarterbacking as far as their own system at home. They will make those decisions, uh, and just as we're going to make our decisions here. But I, I do think broadly we are on the right track, and I just hope domestic politics, for reasons that are totally unrelated to this, doesn't get in the way. That's, that's my biggest worry at the moment. The, yeah, the question regards uh, the murder of journalists. This is one of the most disturbing things, obviously, that uh, is happening. Uh, and um, uh, I think it is clear to outside observers that uh, although organized crime is not as obviously active in Russia as it was in the 90s, uh, much of it has actually been absorbed into the bureaucracy, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, that uh, one of the most dangerous things you can do in Russia is to be an investigative journalist. And if you've got a crooked governor or a crooked oligarch uh, nearby, or you've got a terrorist situation uh, brewing in the Caucasus as they ha still have simmering, uh, well, it is very dangerous to try to expose that, and a number of journalists, of course, have been assassinated. And uh, m these cases have not been solved, and that, that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, a major scandal. Uh, and I think, you know, it's a question to what degree, how strongly the average Russian feels about it, uh, it's just hard to say. Obviously, and nobody likes that image, uh, but uh, the fact is that in these matters, very often local authorities are closely tied in with criminal elements. And particularly in the Caucasus, it would seem that they are using, you know, one faction of Chechen uh, hoodlums to control the other factions. And so, uh, just like in the drug wars we see uh, around uh, Mexico. I don't know whether there have been many journalists assassination, but, but there have probably been fewer people uh, killed uh, in Russia over this than there has been over drugs in Mexico. Uh, so I'm just, uh, you know, I'm not making any direct comparison. I'm just saying that uh, as bad as this is, it is a very large country. It is one with a lot of corruption. Uh, and a certain amount of crime behind the scenes, and it is not an easy country to govern. Uh, they, and one of the weaknesses now is that there is, they have not yet been able to create a truly independent court system. We see at the top with cases like Yukos and Khodorkovsky, uh, where clearly political uh, considerations have been ruling. So, I think this is the sort of issue that uh, needs to be taken up and is being taken up in uh, places like uh, uh, the European Court and uh, uh, various human rights organizations. I think the best way to foreigners to deal with it is not so much actions of governments. Uh, after all, all governments have problems, maybe not the same ones, uh, with violence internally. Uh, but uh, in, uh, in various NGOs and others, uh, making clear to the Russians that uh, they, you know, th this is going to be a black eye for them in the world if they, if they let these practices continue. The question of, you know, how one brings the Russian economy into the 21st century and modernizes it, of course, is the, the $64 trillion question these days. Um, and, of course, uh, President Medvedev has set a, a, a goal of modernizing, and particularly in the high-tech area. And just recently, we had a visit of the California governor, uh, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, with a delegation from Silicon Valley uh, looking at uh, 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 the, the Russian um, aspiring uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, frankly, I... I think they are sincere in wanting more investment, but until they go further in at least two areas, one is reducing the whole scope of, uh, of the corruption, uh, number one, and then number two, showing that they will begin to treat foreign investors and foreign firms uh, 
fairly in their legal system, that there is legal recourse. And neither of those things have really been met yet. And uh, now, that doesn't mean you can't do business in Russia, but I think our trade is running at around 35 billion, something like that. But given the size of our countries, that's, that's pretty small. And there are, there are businesses that are making money there, uh, particularly in areas in consumer goods and, and other areas. One of my sons actually works for a Russian bank uh, in uh, 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 marketing and trading uh, securities. But uh, so, you know, uh, and I, I understand there are about 100,000 Americans actually living in Moscow and, and St. Petersburg now, and, and many of them in business or, or working for Russian firms. So a, a more is going on than uh, many people might think, but it is nothing like China in terms of, of volume or uh, 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 penetration. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I would just, it seems to me that, uh, yeah, you can continue to probably to get those who make deals if we hear that uh, Walmart is going to go. Uh, well, if, they, if they're able to negotiate appropriate deals with the local uh, uh, people, uh, they can probably make a go. McDonald's has, uh, and uh, they're, they're doing very well. But they go into the, you know, joint ventures with, with Russian uh, enterprises, uh, and uh, then it depends upon whether you choose your partner well, because in Russia, you're probably not going to be protected by Russian law. So I think it's going to be a, a, a slow process because so much is rooted in attitudes and habits and the fact that uh, the, the legal system is really can't be as yet a confident recourse uh, for someone if you get into a dispute with your, 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 your Russian partner or even worse with uh, the Russian authorities. So I think, I, I think they have a ways to go. Uh, but the potential is really enormous, and not only in consumer goods areas. Uh, and they could gain so much. You know, uh, Ambassador Pickering, Tom Pickering, our, our former ambassador to Russia, tells me uh, that Boeing has hired about 1,400 aeronautical engineers. The, their new Dreamliner is largely engineered by Russian engineers. But the Russians haven't been able to build a competitive civil aircraft. And it doesn't that they don't, it's not that they don't know how to build planes, it's just that to put it together and build it so it's competitive, safe, fuel economy, you know, fuel economy, all of these things it takes to be competitive on, on a Western market, they haven't gotten there yet. And it's not that they don't have well-trained people, it's not that they don't work hard, uh, they can, uh, but uh, the, uh, the th there's just something there that they do need, the foreign investment and so on. And I think they really understand it at, at the top. But how far you can go? I mean, they've been talking about curbing corruption now for, well, well over a decade, and it just seems that not much happens. Uh, the whole issue of German unification was driven not by the great powers negotiating with each other, but by events in Germany. I, I don't think any of us, when the Berlin Wall first came down, realized how imminent it was going to be uh, that you would get a, a totally united Germany. Uh, and I think most of us thought that there could be a period when obviously a lot of East Germans would go over to the West, but if the wall was open, uh, there, you know, there, might be, uh, there might be a certain stability uh, um, uh, between the two, uh, which would be supported by fairly substantial uh, uh, economic aid from West Germany. But obviously the people in the streets uh, January, February, March uh, 1990 had different opinions in East Germany. And so the German events were driven by events on the ground in Germany. Every single uh, leader in this period changed attitudes. And I'm, I'm now putting up a, a, a website to discuss this, these negotiations and I've just been reviewing some of the documents. And uh, uh, Thatcher and then Mitterrand both 
told Gorbachev um, just before and just after the wall came down uh, that they thought German unification was way off and they were opposed to it happening immediately. Uh, we took a very equivocal stance initially, uh, mainly that we weren't going to bring pressure to bear on Gorbachev by, in President Bush's terms, of dancing on the wall. Uh, in fact, he had responded earlier to some of Gorbachev's appeals that when he went to Eastern Europe, he not make too much uh, of it. Uh, you, you'll often see in the media, a picture of Ronald Reagan saying in 1987, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, and then it comes down. Well, that's not quite how it happened. And in, in uh, 89, uh, Gorbachev sent a private message through me. Uh, uh, actually, it was a, on a cultural occasion. We went to a concert by Van Cliver and the pianist, and Gorbachev had my wife and me come and, and uh, uh, have a, uh, a bit of cognac after the performance. And in that, he said, uh, please ask your president to be more considerate when he goes to Eastern Europe. And Bush kept the rhetoric down. But by keeping the rhetoric down, Gorbachev was able to bring more pressure on the East Germans and the others to reform. If we had been shouting still, it, it would not have been nearly as easy for him. So we cooperated in that way. And of course, just after the wall came down, uh, within a few weeks, they met at Malta. And they may, decided we're no longer enemies. And uh, Bush assured Gorbachev that if he would withdraw from Eastern Europe, allow elections to go forward they, uh, uh, there, um, we weren't talking about German unification yet, uh, that we would not take advantage of it. That, uh, these were the phrases used. So when Cole came out with his 10 points, this must have been late November, early December, Gorbachev was furious. He thought he was pushing it. Even though at that time, Cole was talking about a stage process and confederation would come first and federation only sometime way off. Uh, and um, the, at that point, early December, the Soviets still thought that they could have a separate GDR, but with free borders. Uh, by the end of December, I called on Fallin, who was then their central committee chief handling Germany, and I said, I understand you think that German unification is a case for the future. He said, we thought it was, now we see it's something that we have to deal with immediately. So during the month of December, they still had the idea that if Germany unified, they wanted to do it as the basis of negotiation between the two German states, number one, and number two, a united Germany would have to leave NATO. So that was our diplomatic task uh, in uh, uh, early uh, 90. Uh, was because uh, we early on saw that a Germany, a united Germany without NATO, this would not only have terrified the British and the French, a lot of other people it would have, that, uh, because NATO's purpose was not only to keep the Russians at bay, it was also to keep Germany fully integrated into Europe, to keep Germany down, as uh, some had said. And so, uh, Baker tried to convince Gorbachev that it was in the Soviet interest, which I think it was, for a united Germany to stay in NATO, prefacing them by saying, assuming there would be no movement of NATO jurisdiction to the east, and not one inch. Now, what they were talking about was what would happen to the territory of the GDR, and the initial idea, uh, which Baker had gotten from German Foreign Minister Genscher, was that they would simply exclude the territory from GDR from NATO jurisdiction altogether. When he got back to Washington, the lawyer said, you can't do that. I mean, a country is either in NATO or it isn't. So we worked out later, they decided the negotiations would be two plus four, 
at first the Russians wanted four plus two. What's the difference? The outside powers were to decide and impose on the Germans. We said you can't do that. The Germans have to be the ones, and then the victors in World War II will deal with the external aspects after the Germans decide what they want. Meanwhile, the East Germans were voting with their feet for a united Germany. And in March, I believe it was 13th, in 1990, they actually, uh, the CDU, the ruling party at that time in West Germany, won the elections in East Germany. So you no longer had a situation where there was an East German government that could have negotiated. So the easy way was simply to have the Linda, the, the states in East Germany, adhere to the West German constitution. And this in itself, I think, I, increasingly, the Soviet leadership, I think by March and April, they were telling me that, well, the British, they, well, they would say other countries want us to hold up German unification, but we're not going to do it because Germany is too important for our future that we cannot be seen by the Germans as the ones that kept them apart. So we're going to allow German unification. And eventually, I think Gorbachev was convinced it was in their interest to have uh, uh, West Germany in NATO for all the reasons that we said. And then in the 2 plus 4, they made provision whereby uh, there would be no non-German NATO troops stationed in the territory of the GDR and no NATO troops, period, stationed there while there were still Soviet troops. I was reminded uh, in a recent meeting with uh, some Russians that the Soviet forces in Germany, the Soviet group of forces in Germany, were larger in terms of manpower and equipment than the total Russian army is today. And it, uh, their big problem was, what do you do with them? And of course, they got loans from the Germans uh, to build housing and barracks and so on. Uh, they, actually, they could have probably gotten more if he had pressed even harder. Uh, but I'm sorry if that's a very long answer, but the fact is, Gorbachev's views and the Soviet views were changing week by week and sometimes day by day in exactly what they did. But the driving force was not the diplomacy at the top, it was what was happening on the ground in East Germany. I think it was a very big mistake to start talking about a Ukrainian and Georgian membership in NATO. And not just because it's going to create a Russian reaction, but primarily because neither of them met <coughs> anywhere near the normal criteria that you would want for an ally. Until we began that, uh, we had always insisted, and I think rightly so, that a country solve any internal territorial problems before you become members of the alliance. Hungary and Romania had to settle the problem over Transylvania, and uh, whatever problem Hungary had with Slovakia and so on. You had to do that first. Well, Georgia obviously had not solved these problems uh, with uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, problems that that in principle were not entirely different. In fact, they were very similar to the problem we faced, Kosovo and Serbia. And particularly in as much as we bombed Serbia over their treatment of Kosovo without UN approval and against Russian opposition. Then when the Georgians were obviously beginning to threaten to use force to uh, bring back uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia under Georgian control, uh, you know, it had started actually with military actions of Georgia against the previous autonomous area. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned, the, the, the speech that uh, the first uh, President Bush gave in uh, 1991, where we saw that Georgia, already going de facto independent, was trying to suppress by force its own minorities. Now, this is something we, we have been very inconsistent in addressing. We followed one policy regarding Kosovo, 
we followed another policy regarding Georgia, and we made a further mistake, I think, in, in uh, the, uh, the last 10 years in uh, allowing Georgia to arm much more than they really needed. Okay, they sent troops to uh, Iraq and, and, and so on, but I think we should have been telling them all along, you're not going to be able to recover those areas by force. You need to negotiate, and you need to find some way to give them some assurances that they will have at least cultural autonomy. I could talk a long time about some of these issues as they occurred in the Soviet Union, but these were areas that in the Soviet Union were autonomous legally and had a right to their own languages. And the result was that most of them learned their own language and Russian, and in many cases they didn't really know Georgian. And Georgian were insisting, all right, it's part of Georgia, you will use Georgian, and that's the only official language. You know, it's sort of like uh, Irishmen saying, well, if you're going to be a loyal Irishman, you've got to speak Gaelic. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. In other words, uh, obviously, Georgia wanted NATO membership in order to have NATO allow them to use force with impunity to put down these areas, but that should not have been a goal of NATO. Ukraine is a different case. Ukraine is one where the majority of people did not want to be in NATO. It is a country whose security problems are internal a cultural and political split between East and West, and uh, uh, encouraging them uh, to uh, uh, come into NATO would, if it had happened, would almost certainly have split the country. And in the case of Crimea, if the Ukrainian government kept insisting that the Russians close the base, uh, I think that uh, they, they would have instigated uh, demands for a referendum. You've got a largely, I think over 60% Russian population in Crimea that economically is very dependent on that base. Uh, why have they never, you know, everybody else, uh, the Russians would say, everybody else has a right of self-determination except Russians. And, uh, and yet, you know, um, and there's something to that, in a sense, that uh, the Crimea was never voted as to whether they would prefer to be in Russia or Ukraine. They were told, you're in Ukraine, that's it, and uh, 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 anything else is uh, Russian imperialism. Uh, why open up these, you know, this can of worms? Uh, so it seemed to me that uh, we made serious mistakes in, uh, without making conditions. Now, okay, what is, should our policy be now? I think we should be happy that the current Ukrainian government is uh, trying to live cooperatively with Russia to the degree they do. You can imagine how we would react if Canada or Mexico began to make military alliances with another great power. In fact, one of the reasons the United States went into World War I was the famous infamous Zimmerman telegram when the Germans began to negotiate to try to uh, make an alliance with Mexico. That was almost as important as the Lusitania in bringing us into World War I. Large countries don't want other large countries building bases or having allies, particularly in areas that had once been part of their country. I mean, why Americans with their Monroe Doctrine can't understand this psychology is really beyond me. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the case of Ukraine, as I say, Ukraine's security problem is internal, and we need, uh, it, Ukraine needs a government uh, that will bring the people together, will be relaxed on issues like language. If they want to use Russian or some mixture or Ukrainian, fine. Uh, uh, don't ban Russian t TV and so on. Uh, I mean, the Irish get along very well with their nationalism, uh, speaking English, uh, and uh, why not? Uh, you can be a perfectly good Ukrainian and speak Russian. I think you, you have to, uh, uh, they have to develop that attitude. Also, Ukraine cannot have a future if it sets out to be totally divorced from and hostile to Russia, any more than Canada can from the United States. And I don't think Russia is demanding that much.
uh, in, in a sense. Uh, in both countries, uh, the economy is suffering from post-Soviet type problems. Uh, I'm not sure that corruption is any less in Ukraine. Uh, Jinx probably knows uh, better than I because he's closer to that uh, than in Russia. But the fact is, this it's a problem in both countries and both of them are struggling with the heritage of, of the Soviet system. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, our encouragement should be, uh, certainly we, we support Ukrainian sovereignty and independence, but uh, we got to recognize that the neighborhood they're in, uh, they, their own interest as well as ours is that there be decent relations with Russia.